Okay, we're moving on to our next section in Theology Proper Part 1. We're going to start looking at non-Christian views of God, okay? And it's significant, especially when we're doing polemic, apologetics, and elenctic theology, is that uh, not only do we learn in advance how to spot and recognize false doctrine, but there's an added bonus is that when you teach and compare the truth with the error, it makes the truth all the more clear because now you know why this is true and the other parts are error. So this is why in a study of God, one of the things we do is we look at the defective or incorrect views of God. And this is significant because in our evangelism and our apologetics is that we want to be able to spot the error and help someone get a proper understanding of God. So uh, now my, my background is I have an undergraduate degree and uh, ultimately it's religious studies, which includes comparative religion and ethics and some philosophy of religion. And I can tell you, though, it's significant that corresponding to the number of worldviews, there really aren't that many different views of God. As we'll see, you know, there's, there's pantheism, there's polytheism, there's, you know, uh, dualism. You start going down the list, you end up with five or six basic views of God. So this is uh, uh, hopefully a breather here where you're not going to have to read about 2,000 views of God. You read and understand the arguments for and against maybe a half dozen of them. And then you'll, you're fully equipped to start doing analysis of uh, the various false views. So roughly on page 10 of the course syllabus, uh, it's non-Christian views of God or defective views of God. And what's significant here is that all non-Christian views of God are either false or they're defective in some way. Either they don't correspond with reality, as we'll see later on, the real and true God is the Trinity. There is one eternally existing God, okay, who simultaneously exist as three distinct persons or three mo personal modes of subsistence, okay? More on that in a few lectures when we look at the doctrine of the Trinity. That's the true view of God. Almost all the other views of God might say something that's true about God, but then they make false, false statements about God, and they don't say enough about God. So that's what we're going to dive in here and look at some of these things. For example, we'll start with pantheism. And pantheism covers what? Pretty much Hinduism and roughly the New Age movement and some independent movements that believe that, very important here, from the, the Greek word pan and theos. Pan meaning everything or all and theos, God. So everything is God, according to the pantheist. And more significantly in pantheism, not only is everything that exists divine, but they also affirm monism, as in mono, monotheism, one and only one. Everything is divine, and everything is only one thing. See, that's what's significant uh, about pantheism, is they're claiming that everything that exists is divine, and everything is that one thing that is divine. So, uh, significant here, uh, many things that we can say about the true and the living God. One of the first things we have to distinguish is God's immanence versus God's transcendence. In God's immanence, Alt, and that's I-M-M-A, not imminent, as something about to happen, but immanence, as it says, means that God is present and active in His creation, okay? Properly speaking, that is divine immanence, and that, yes, in divine providence, God is present and active, He's directing the creation, He's relating to people, all of that is divine immanence, okay, present and active. But also what's important about the true and the living God is God's transcendence from His creation. God as a being and as a distinct, infinite, self-existing, you know, divine substance is not the creation. He transcends the creation. So you have at least two things that exist, God and the creation. So God is not the creation, so we say He transcends it, at least in substance, and yet He is present and active in this world that He made. So. That's one of the most important things we begin with to think about true monotheism and Trinitarian monotheism. But 
let's look now at you know, the types of pantheism, because ultimately, what is pantheism? We would call that uh, pure or complete or absolute immanence. Okay? Not only is God present and active in the creation, He is the creation. Okay? So that's why, again, why? Because only one thing exists, and that's God. And so this is why, you know, as I mentioned in my prolegomena lectures, it's that, look, only Christianity is a worldview that someone can live 100% consistently with. And for that, it's, it's significant because if someone is a pantheist and they're going to affirm that only one thing exists, as we go through the, uh, you know, the critiques of pantheism, well, if only one thing exists, there's no subject-object relationships. Or as some uh, philosophers and theologians have said, there's no I-thou relationship. If there's no I-thou relationship, there's no fellowship, there's no worship. Uh, none of that is, is possible because everything is one thing. Everything is divine. So here's the deal. You talk to someone who's a pantheist, and they say everything is divine, and you know, they're worshiping at some idol or some, uh, some temple, and they say, well, first of all, if, if everything is one thing and everything is divine, then you know what? Look in the mirror and start singing how great thou art because you're already God. Why are you worshiping an object when you, you are? Uh, so there is no object. There's only subject. So again, it's sad, but people cannot live consistently with pantheism. And so let's uh, take a minute and look at this view. So everything is divine. Everything is one thing. And ultimately, God is impersonal. So that is what is called absolute pantheism, okay, because that's true pantheism. But because of the various uh, uh, inconsistencies with living life as a pantheism and the conflicts with the actual world, these four other types of pantheism began to develop. And so to accommodate, really to do what? To accommodate you know, people's problems with absolute pantheism. So we get something like materialistic or atheistic or physicalistic pantheism. Now, what is that? It's not really pantheism. It's more of a take on atheists who look at the universe as their creator, who look at the universe as being divine. And of course, we uh, looked at the problems with atheism in uh, prolegomena with our worldview uh, uh, lecture. And ultimately, Look, if all you've got is atheistic physicalism, you have a bunch of protons, neutrons, and electrons accidentally bumping into each other, and that's it. That's all you got. Okay, So that's why it's significant, but because everybody does, as they say, have that God-shaped uh, vacuum in their heart, they got to worship something. So a lot of atheists end up worshiping the universe and calling it divine. So everything is in some sense divine. So um, significantly more... Uh, philosophically based, some apologists for the pantheistic worldview developed the concept of modal pantheism. And what is important for us to know is that uh, the concept of a mode, when we start making distinctions, is mode is the way or manner in which an entire essence or substance can exist. Okay, So that's the mode of something. So, for example, we can distinguish the different modes of water. There's a frozen mode, a liquid mode, and a, and a gaseous mode of water, but it's the same substance, okay? So we're distinguishing the mode of H2O, not that it's H2O. Got it? Okay, so that's, that's a modal distinction. It's the way an entire essence or substance exists in a particular way. Now, a modal pantheist would say something like this. You're having a discussion with them. Well, you Trinitarians talk about God being in three personal modes. Well, guess what? You know, we look at the entire creation, which is divine, as saying, hey, physical things are a mode of God. Uh, you know, angels are a mode of God, and so on and so forth. But here's the problem, is that it doesn't fit, and it's equivocating and changing or is using what we call a stipulative definition of the concept of mode, because, again, to be a mode of an essence, you have to have all the attributes of that essence. So when you say that a physical thing is a mode of God, yeah, but that physical thing is limited and contingent. 
It doesn't have infinite spirituality, so it can't be a mode of the divine, which is infinite spirit. So again, but this is a way that some, uh, again, apolog apologists for pantheism or the New Age movement or something would, would misuse the concept of uh, modal pantheism. So again, gone because no, because all these things you list from trees to human beings don't have all the attributes of divine, so they can't be a mode of the essence. Whereas the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in the doctrine of the Trinity, in fact, are simply modes of the essence. The Son is omnipotent, omniscient, self-existent, you name it, just as the Father and the Spirit. They each possess all of the divine attributes simultaneously, but they're different modes of existing or subsisting. Now, absolute idealism, this is the idea in some, uh, some groups, for example, Christian science, science of mind is cults of Christianity that says, yeah, everything is divine, but everything is the divine mind. Okay. So you tend to have what? Instead of having God as being impersonal, now God's got a mind and everything is the divine mind. Well, again, the problem is nobody lives consistently with this. They, you know, if, if a pantheist is having a discussion with you, they just acknowledge that there's something that exists other than God. You know, if you think you're God, then why are you talking to me? You already know I'm God. Why are you, you know, communicating to an object when you're the subject? But in uh, absolute idealism, this would be, for example, that God is all, God is good, God is mine, and God is spirit. And this is where you get to, for example, uh, a more robust uh, understanding of the Hindu doctrine of maya, which is illusion, where the physical world, evil, and all of that, because God is all and God is good and God is spirit, all that other stuff doesn't actually exist. It's just an illusion. And this is ultimately, we think about Christian science, which at one point was probably one of the larger of the cults of Christianity in the, in the 20th century. Now it's kind of waned in its influence. But Mary Baker Eddy's theology was that all is mine. And the problem is uh, her emphasis on you know, uh, science and health with key to the scriptures, her, her ultimate textbook for the Christian scientist, teaches you ultimately how to heal yourself. Why? See, what you're doing is, because all is mine, you're dreaming all the time. There is no physical world. So the fact is, is that what you need to do is learn to control your dreams. And then because dreams are reality, mind is reality. If you learn to control your dreams, your reality changes. So this is why, again, the, uh, the falsehood of Christian science is, well, physical world doesn't exist. And boy, here's the problem. If you're a Christian science, you're not supposed to go to doctors. Why? Well, because, you know, if you go to a doctor, you're, you're acknowledging this illusion even more. So you're supposed to refuse to go to doctors and just use your mind to change your reality. And that's why it's significant that even for Mary Baker Eddy, Mary Baker Eddy wore glasses, she got sick, she died, so on and so forth. Didn't work for her. Also, there are exceptions in Christian science, like uh, those of you in the medical community, if you have an open fracture, in other words, you know, the bones sticking through your skin, uh, guess what? You can get a timeout from, uh, you know, the Christian science uh, fake universe and go to the doctor and have your bones set. So significantly, though, but there are people in the world, and this is the important part. We love people, and we don't want people to suffer because of false theology. People suffer when they believe these worldviews. And I'll, I'll continue in a little bit uh, to add to pantheism. But the last type here is emanational pantheism. And with emanational pantheism, that's the last. Similar to modal pantheism is that uh, an emanation is that, you know, uh, an emanational pantheist would say that finite things, physical things, personhood are like the outer edges of divine because the divine is like a lotus flower that's unfolding. At the core, God is infinite spirit and impersonal, but at the outer edges of this lotus flower are the emanations where he's personal, uh, where you know, limited and physical things exist and individual persons. But uh, of course, the problem is what you really end up with is something that looks a lot more like monotheism. Uh, because uh, that's the way the universe really is. It's monotheistic. And you also have the existence of different substances that are created, limited, and contingent, like physical stuff, human persons, and so forth. So um, 
In the next segment, I'll go a little bit more into refuting pantheism. So <clears throat> uh, we'll come back in a few minutes. Thanks.